For hundreds of years in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, Catholic Croats, Serbian Orthodox, Muslims, and Jews all lived together. But as Yugoslavia disintegrated in the 1990s, many Serbian, Croatian, and some Bosnian political leaders said, we cannot live together. Many people believed that, and war came. But not everyone in Bosnia got that message. Here is one story. Between 1992 and 1995, for three years during the siege, Sarajevo was cut off from the world. Its great buildings went up in flames. More than 12,000 people were killed by mortars and snipers. Walls were built to hide people from the snipers. Signs were even put up to warn the population, but it didn't always help. The Bosnian Serb military forces cut off the water to the city, so this park in the center of town is where people came to do their wash, fill plastic jugs to bring water home to drink, to bathe in, to flush the toilet. And this is how they got it home. An entire society was reduced to scrounging, avoiding snipers, selling whatever they had or hoped to sell, and then coming home to burn a few books or a chair to keep warm and cook on a wood stove set up in the middle of the living room. A great multi-ethnic city in Europe was dying. The Americans and the Europeans sent in food from time to time and watched from the sidelines as Sarajevo was bombed. People were losing hope, holding on. Even though most Serbs and Croats had left Sarajevo, some chose not to listen to their political leaders and felt that different people could live together. So some Serbs and Jews and Muslims and Croats continued to live together in this war-torn city of Sarajevo. And they were buried together, too. On the night the shelling started in May 1992, people from the neighborhood around the synagogue sought shelter in it. That's when the community leaders like Ivica Cherezhnez, an architect, and Jakob Finci, a lawyer, offered them shelter for the night and food the next day. Soon others heard about what was going on in the synagogue and about La Benevolencia, the community's humanitarian aid agency. Not only did people come looking for help, they came looking to help. So let's meet some of them. The medical team. This is Surgeon, who became the chief doctor for La Benevolencia. He worked with Yadranka, another doctor, and Yasna was the nurse. Mirjana was the pharmacist. And for security, there was Adnan. And although he never had trouble with anyone, Adnan called on Sheriff, whose job was actually cutting wood for the kitchen. In the kitchen, Tsitsko was the cook and Mara helped him serve. And Novo brought in the food from the warehouse, while in the office, Slobodan ran the computers for the community, and Atso was the secretary. Vera was the treasurer, and Sonia was the head of the women's club, a Bohoreta. For communication, Vlado worked the two-way radio, while Timur kept the logbook in the radio room. And Dan helped deliver the post. Which of these people were Jewish? Catholic Croats? Serbian Orthodox? Muslim? 
At La Bonne Valencia, no one asked. No one cared. Here's how La Bonne Valencia operated during the war. Surgeon tended patients in the community center and he made house calls to people like Donka Nikolic, well into her 90s, who needed an injection every week just to keep breathing. During the war, like the water, the post was also cut off. So the Jewish community brought in the letters for the city and journalists were asked to bring in the post and come to the synagogue where letters were filed. Then people were phoned and heard those wonderful words. You've got mail. Since telephone lines were cut, La Benevolencia even set up a two-way radio system to the outside world, and families from all over Sarajevo came over to use it and to send messages to loved ones abroad. With help from the outside world, mostly from the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, La Benevolencia set up three pharmacies, and everything in it was free. Even a dentist came into the community center every week, as did children from the neighborhood who came in for puppet shows and celebrations to get their minds of what they could not have and so La Benevolencia could show them that someone cared. Many older Sarajevans sent their children and grandchildren abroad and remained alone. So the Jewish woman's group, La Bohoreta, kept its members busy by creating treats for the children and spending their time together. During the siege of Sarajevo, La Bonne Valencia, working with JDC, arranged rescue convoys out of the city. The largest was in February 1994. To make it happen, JDC sent in logistics experts to meet with the Bosnian Prime Minister, with the Bosnian Serbs, and then with the UN garrison. When permissions arrived, lists were made, the buses arrived, and those approved made their way to the Jewish community center. The old boarded the buses, the young, and they prepared to leave the city where they were born in, the city that they loved very much. The UN escorted the convoy out of the besieged city. They raced across no man's land and entered into Bosnian Serb territory. That's where the UN remained and the convoy, filled with 294 Sarajevans from every ethnic group, made its way around the war zone and down to the coast of Croatia, its final destination. A journey that normally would take from Sarajevo to the coast of four hours took them over 20. Of those who left on that convoy, here are two stories. You are looking at Zainab Hardiga, the first Muslim to receive a Righteous Gentile Award for saving a Jewish neighbor during the Holocaust. Her daughter Sarah and granddaughter Stella cared for her, as did Surgeon, the Serbian doctor who worked for the Jewish community and cared for his Muslim friends. Zainaba and her family were invited to come to Israel and they left on that convoy in 1994. You didn't abandon the Jews, Milton Wolf, the JDC president told her. We're not going to abandon you. And when she arrived in Israel, even Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin welcomed her. Dennis Karolich, also a Muslim, was 13 years old in 1994. Dennis helped bring the water into the Jewish community every day. 
and he and his father Harris lived with Nada Levy. And Dennis's father was also helping out in the Jewish community. Dennis was best friends with Rasho, Nada's grandson, and the two would study their school books even when they couldn't go to school. In January 1994, Dennis was slightly wounded in a mortar attack. Surgeon picked the glass out of his shoulders and his back, and Dennis's father told him, you're going to go to Israel, even though I can't, so you can be safe. It's not easy leaving your home. It's not easy for a father to say goodbye to his son. But Rasho and Dennis rode through the night, and the next day, for the very first time in 22 months, Dennis was in a place where no one was shooting at him. In the years ahead, Dennis would live in Israel and finish school there. And then he moved to Vienna, where he spent a decade at the Holocaust Restitution Agency, the National Fund. When asked why a Muslim from Bosnia would work there, Dennis said, I remember when I was growing up in Sarajevo, everyone I knew liked working together. And that was what La Benevolencia was all about. So by my working here today, perhaps I can pay just a little bit of that back. 